Well, okay. for those, those of you who uh, don't know about the Institute for Art and Olfaction, we are now online, but we're a nonprofit based in LA's Chinatown. Um, and we're, we're uh, dedicated to experimentation and access in the field of perfume. With the current situation, obviously we're not doing anything in person anymore. So we're excited to launch sort of an online program. And we're taking this opportunity to expand to the senses as a whole. So you'll be seeing a lot more things from us about always with the you know first scent, but also some other things. So we're very excited to have uh, James back. He's spoken with us at our at our spot a couple times, and he's our favorite esotericist. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a doctor, so, you know, he knows what's up. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I'll mute myself again, James, and I think, uh, you know, whenever you want, I'll, I'll give you the thumbs up when we have, when everyone's in, or you can just start. Okay. You and, you think. know, um, if there's something glitchy, um, text me or unmute yourself. Um, Check. So, to, as an orientation, if you've never done Zoom, there is a little chat function. If you go to the very bottom, there's like a little bubble with three dots, and that's chat. So, um, if there's something, just even like I just wrote a hello in there, but if you want to just make a little hi or something in there, that's fine. So, here's how I will deal with questions. Um, I will um, try to keep most but not all of the questions towards the end. I will attempt to stop um, partway through, I'm looking at my little clock here, maybe about a little less than halfway through. Um, I can answer some questions. So if you have something that, that is really pops into your head, use the chat function and just, you could either write Q with the topic, like Q topic cinnamon or something, um, or, you know, type a couple words if, if you can type that much. And then, um, you know, I can see your names and I'll just, I'll try to answer a couple questions, but most of them will be towards the end, um, just to make it easier. And yeah, sadly we have to keep people muted because otherwise it's like chaotic and you can't hear anything. So um, hopefully you can hear me okay. I, or the Saskia is saying yes, so that's good. Okay. So, I mean, I might as well just start in here. So, um, she gave a little bit of an introduction. I just wanna say, um, you know, I'm excited to do this. I'm very ex excited about the fact that the Institute for Art and Olfaction has this goal of perfume education along with other things. And um, I was talking with Saskia recently and I was just saying, um, you know, my history is that it goes back decades because I was doing research in olfaction when I was in medical school at UCLA. And research consisted of spending months going through stacks of books. And I ended up like writing the Fragrance Foundation to get articles and so on. It was like incredibly difficult to get material. And basically perfumery is still kind of based on this guild system where it's uh, a master uh, to apprentice. There's a lot of things that just aren't available to the general public. And she's really opening up a lot of information that hasn't been available before. So currently we're in this like nightmarish, horrible, horrible world. But <laughs> one weird positive is in the last couple of weeks, there's been an almost instantaneous revolution in education because pretty much all the major institutions and schools have had to adopt formats like Zoom to teach people stuff. So this has been something that's been trickling along for a while. I remember a couple of years ago, a friend was taking an online class at Stanford and it was like this huge deal, like, oh, wow, this is really new. So um, now we're suddenly thrust into this and I know um, Saskia has been pushed off a cliff and she's like swimming, you know, trying to set up this stuff and doing a great job. And um, it's really, uh, uh, scary, but on the other hand, this is an opportunity for people to learn stuff at home, which I think is super important. So um, having access to this is great, and I'm glad that we can do it. So, and then the other thing that they do is amazing, is that they give access to fragrant materials for people to experience, to um, smell, and to sort of play with and understand. And this is amazing too, because I can tell you from the past, it's extremely difficult to obtain a lot of this stuff. I mean, basically, if you had like a wholesale license, you would have to order like a kilo of stuff and it was just like completely difficult to obtain these materials. So um, 
this is really important too, because I'll talk about this a little bit, but one of the most important ways to learn is to just smell and to smell a lot of stuff. Um, and um, so today we're gonna have a little bit of a sniff along in the beginning, and I may prompt you if you have spices at home to smell along with me. But uh, it, it is part of a, a sensory training that pretty much I recommend for everyone. And that kind of segues me into some educational links that I gave you. So, um, boop. all right, here we go. Props. <laughs> I hope you can see this. Okay. So this, there we go. This is, oops, I have someone else's. Oh, why are we getting someone else's picture on here? I'm not sure. Hmm. Okay. So I have no idea, but hello. Um, so this is uh, Mandy F. Tell's book, Fragrant. And um, there's a chapter in here on cinnamon, which I really like. And um, I can tell you that this gives a really good overview, just basically of spices, of cinnamon in particular. And um, it's available through Mandy, or if you have a library card, uh, it's on a lot of library collections and their digital collections. It's really good. So this is really great. The other thing that I put on my list is voila th this giant book there we go so this is this bible by arctander um which amazingly there's now a legal digital copy of this which i gave you the link for so this is super nerdy and we're going to be going over some of the spices but this has incredible details about the different sorts of um uh, preparations that spices uh, are available in the various like you know essential oils and absolutes and supercritical co2s and so on and it gives a lot more detail than i'll ever be able to do um and then three uh i gave you a link for a blog by victoria called um bois de jasmin and she's been doing this since about 2005 it's really amazing she's a perfumer who's an incredible writer she has won several Fragrance Foundation Awards. And what's amazing is she has 15 years of uh, articles and you can search through there. And she has uh, a number of articles that refer to spices, both in fine fragrance, and she's also very much into the culinary aspect of them as well. So I highly recommend that. So these are a couple of resources for people. Um, so, what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit and then we're immediately going to go to the slides and jump into the material because um, it's kind of complex. I need to give people a little bit of um, kind of theory first and then go into kind of the specifics. I know most people will really want to have some of the specifics like what spices are for what, which I'm going to try to get into pretty quickly. So I'm going to hold up a couple things and I was testing this before. Hopefully you guys can see it. Let me just make sure I get it on the camera. Okay. So this is oil of nutmeg and I'm turning it around now and you can see it says USP and what that means is US pharmacopeia. That means it's a pharmaceutical grade essential oil. This bottle is a vintage bottle that don't hate me, but I got it long ago off of eBay. Um, it was actually full. And um, the reason I have this is because a central core thing that I'll be talking about today is that fragrances are medicines. Um, in this case, literally this um, nutmeg was a pharmaceutical nutmeg, which was used for medical reasons, mostly topical. Um, but it was also by the Fritsch brothers and their essential oils were used by perfumers as well. Um, and, and what I'm going to be talking about is just this sort of intersection between like fragrance, medicine, and magic. So this is a good start for that. So before we dive into this, let me just see, I talked a little bit, let me have my notes. Um, oh, okay. So hold on. So, um, Victoria's blog now has some, uh, little videos and some of them are on scent training. And she talks a little bit about um, just waking up in the morning and smelling things around the house and how you can take, take notes about these things. And I know we have a class coming up next week 
It talks about translating uh, what you smell into language. But basically, a lot of it is just, it's helpful to just smell things and to write notes about them, even if you think you're just totally bungling it, to try to give your first impressions or associations is helpful. She gives the kind of basics, which if you go to the uh, website for Institute for Art and Olfaction, they also give basic things, but frequently people will put fragrances on a scent strip like this or a blotter, and then they will do short, I think, uh, Saskia calls them uh, bunny sniffs, like little staccato sniffs, not long sniffs. So you'll like have it like a half inch below your nose and do short sniffs. People frequently move it like this and maybe do several sniffs and then write down your impressions. So today I, participating, I have what people would call a cinnamon stick, but I'm sorry, it's actually technically cassia. <laughs> I will tell you about that. But um, it obviously it's not going to smell that much unless I break it because these things are very woody. So there I am snapping it. So I'm sniffing a little bit. Um, <laughs> I see I'm amusing Saskia. Hi, Saskia. So um, I will be talking about this. It's really interesting because um, uh, Mandy's chapter has a lot on cinnamon and cassia. Um, she she cast Cassia as like kind of this trashy, ugly stepsister of cinnamon, um, whereas I actually um, uh, kind of don't think of Cassia quite like that. Um, Cassia actually has um, a lot of coumarin in it. Coumarin is something that occurs naturally in like oak moss and hay and grasses and has this very beautiful vanilla hay scent um, and has a lot of things that are interesting to use in Japanese incense and so on. So. It's interesting to smell this fresh. Um, it has like a lot of fruity notes. It's intriguing. Okay, so um, I will prompt people to get into this. Um, but uh, just before I start the slides, let me just give you some kind of some suggestions for this. So um, I will be talking about fragrance. I will obviously be talking about sort of folklore and magic. There is no reason why you have to believe that there's such a thing as magic. It's not necessary. But I will ask you for today as a thought experiment <laughs> to assume a magical worldview just for this evening. And so what that means is to assume a view that we would call it, that we refer to as animistic, where everything is alive and interconnected, a view in which we share the world with other disembodied supernatural creatures. Um, and, and just pretending you live in the Renaissance when people actually pretty much believe this is helpful because a lot of these ideas make more sense. And I think it kind of opens up the sort of poetic aspects of it, which doesn't um, require you to actually believe that it's literally true. So let us kind of enter into the magical world. Okay. Um, bing. Okay, we'll start the slides and then partway through my little head will disappear like Thank God for me. Bye. Okay. <laughs> ready for slides, James? I'm ready for the slides, but okay. I, yeah, just get them ready. Okay. And depicture me. How do I get, turn off my photo? Okay. You are depictured. Okay. So bear with me. Um, I'm crawling around on the floor for a second. <laughs> All right. Okay. So what we have here is my little sorceries of fire and spice intro slide. Um, so I want to start off by just saying a couple things. Um, one of them is just to pay attention about symbolic things associated with fire. So one of them is fire is highly associated with warm colors, warm colors like red, orange, yellow, gold. Um, because this will come up later because there's a lot of correspondences. So um, the whole deal that I'm going to talk about here is that um, in a kind of magical worldview, there is a cosmology where things are created through different elements, and these elements manifest themselves in the physical world in plants, as well as like gemstones and animals and other things. And there is a way to kind of read these elements a lot of time it's through the morphology of the plant or the herb. And in this case, the color of it is very important sometimes. 
Um, with spices, it's super easy because everyone knows that they have a, a sort of a warm impression when you um, taste them. And even in fragrances, people always describe uh, spices as being warm. So it's kind of intuitively obvious that spices are associated with the element of fire. Um, but the whole, uh, the whole symbolism is something I'm going to be going into case by case. Um, but this is just sort of a, a thing to remind you that this is going to be kind of a big deal. Um, okay, so probably advance to the next slide. Okay, so pretty much everyone who's ever popped open anything having to do with perfume has read the little thing that says um, the word perfume comes from the Latin, for, which is per fumum, which means through smoke. Um, and so, you know, that's interesting, but it's important to kind of unpack that. It basically tells us that perfume is based in um, fire rituals, in which case people would offer fires and sacrifices, and then fragrant materials such as precious um, woods and resins and so on would release their fragrance through smoke. Um, nowadays, I would say that fragrance is primarily people for people something that's pleasurable, it has like a hedonic um, kind of value for people. Um, it's pleasurable to smell it. And as you may know, the flavor of things is really probably like 80% olfaction. So the, the flavors that are pleasurable um, are mostly due to olfaction as well. But long before that, really fragrances were much more of a supernatural or spiritual um, sort of thing. And they're also used much more for healing. So this photograph is um, of a fire ritual. So, you know, the last slide also showed fire. Um, and fire is intimately, intimately connected with all kinds of fragrances. And obviously the very name of perfume is related to fire. Uh, it's important for people to keep this in mind that humans have been working with fire for hundreds of thousands of years. And now we have more advanced uh, technologies that allow us to do paleobotany analysis, which is basically going into archaeological sites and finding um, plant materials and dating it and kind of seeing like, wow, these people were like burning these resins. And oftentimes it was much earlier than we had thought. So people actually doing this kind of incense or working spiritually with fire or what we would call fire worship goes back a very, very long time. This particular photograph is from uh, a Vedic fire ritual. So ancient uh, India had cultures in which they used fire and they still to this day, this is a current picture, do these rituals. These involve not just um, the fire, but obviously ritual actions and usually mantras. And there's a lot of symbolic designs. They may have um, what's called a yantra, which is like a geometric mandala and all sorts of other symbolic things that go on um, while they're burning the fire. And they will, they will add things like sandalwood and resins and um, you know ghee, which is clarified butter and so on. And um, this is a basis for a lot of other kinds of uh, rituals and so on that we'll be talking about. Okay, so next. Okay, so I talked to you a little bit I seem to be doing a lot of Latin. I'm just into that right now. So I talked to you a little bit um, about uh, just the fact that the perfume is really related to fire. Also, um, here we have the Latin word sagire, which is, means to perceive keenly by scent. Um, it's the root of the word sagacious. And the word sagus means prophet. So in archaic use, these words that, that talked about people who had a keen sense of smell really basically um, compared them to people who had the ability to see beyond the visual, who could see really subtle things. In many ways, they have prophetic abilities to perceive things that were hidden. So I have here to smell what is hidden to know the occult properties of things. So um, people who had incredible senses of smell were often thought to be kind of um, prophets or they're psychic or they, and, or they were able to sniff out things that other people were not able to sniff out. Okay, so next. 
So for me, um, one of the primary things I'm talking about is that scent is a communication. I know this has been mentioned in other lectures before, but literally in both uh, animals and plants, a lot of these fragrances are used to communicate both to pollinators or you know animals to animals. Um, and so they are literally a communication. And in fact, when you smell things, there is like a message there that you can unpack. And there is a symbol system um, that can be read, um, and it's kind of much like color can be read in art history when you're looking at different colors and things like that. And I'm gonna lead you through that a little bit. Um, part of this is based on some medieval and um, Renaissance theories in which things that you found in nature could be read. It was, it was talked about by the alchemists that you could read the book of nature and that was by looking at sort of the symbolic things that were associated with plants, for instance, to find out secrets about them or what they might be useful for, both in healing and for spiritual purposes. So um, in this case, um, obviously I'm getting back to fire. So there were some cosmologies in which um, the universe was created through binaries, which uh, would be like, you know, a yin yang, night day, and in this case, the binaries would be hot and cold. And these binaries would manifest in the physical world of like plants, animals, people, etc., as well as the spiritual world, the world of spirits and of deities. Um, and these would all be interrelated. Okay, next. Okay, so these, um, hold on, I'm grabbing my, oh my God. I left my phone down here, hold on. Okay, so these um, hot, cold things were considered to be qualities or what we would now call temperaments. Um, and these qualities, and I'm mostly focusing on fire, they could be, they were neither good nor bad. Fire is neither good nor bad. As we know, we get fire, you know, we get solar fire from the sun, we you know, depend on electricity, but it's also extremely destructive and it can kill us. Um, so the elements can occur in both chaotic or refined forms. And this is important because the spices are manifestations of fire and some of them can bring good things and some of them can bring things that are kind of not so good. Um, so I wanna give you some sort of key phrases because these, will come back to you um, when we're talking about spices. And honestly, I think these may apply to all the spices I'm talking about because they're all fairly fiery. And so they will give you hints about what people might use them for in various um, kind of spiritual healing traditions, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So fire is fast, first of all. There's this sense of rapidity with fire that it burns stuff up fast, that it's crackling, it's really quick. <laughs> it's expansive. Things that get hot expand. And so, <laughs> excuse me, fires make things expand or they project things outwards, whereas cold things contract, they bring things inwards. Um, piercing in the sense that it pierces through stuff. Um, <laughs> it also is associated as we'll see with weapons. It's stimulating um, and, um, as far as, uh, you know, kind of character traits, we have a lot of expressions in English and in other languages that are based on these, um, these old ideas about the elements. Like <laughs> someone is sexy, we talk about them being hot or that their love life is spicy. We also on the negative side, see someone as hot headed. <laughs> when you're angry, you're seeing red. Um, so, you know, the fire can have both like good and bad manifestations in this case. But as I'll talk to you about it, as far as like a healing thing, <coughs> excuse me, fire, um, and in this case, spices are known to give you emancipation from stagnation. They actually are used sometimes in spiritual traditions to remove blockages from people's lives when they're kind of stalled, basically. Okay, next. All right, so I, um, I am not going to go, I'm going to go into the four elements, but not incredibly deep because it's just a big tangent. And I'm also not 
going to go too much into astrology, but I will go into some of it. So um, uh, Empedocles, I wrote here in the center, Empedocles and the four root elements. So Empedocles was approximately 5th century um, BC, Sicily. He was a very early Greek philosopher, <laughs> actually weirdly kind of almost like a shaman mystic. Um, not a lot is known about him, but he was extremely, extremely influential in later teachings with um, Pythagorean um, stuff and a lot of mystic theories. But his, his main thing that people know him for are what he called the four root elements that he felt that all creation came from earth, air, fire, and water. And to sort of go through this little diagram, if you look up at the top, fire is considered hot and dry. And if you look at the bottom, um, well, it's kind of cut off, but it says water is wet and cold. Um, air is uh, hot and wet and earth is cold and dry. So we're mostly focusing, of course, on the top, which is fire. But these four elements um, were the basis for uh, all of Greek medicine, um, Hippocratic medicine. And um, these are the things that basically were eventually adopted into a lot of traditional medical systems. Most notably, nowadays, we have Ayurvedic medicine, um, which is primarily in India. There's Unani, which is also a variation that's like a Greek-Persian medicine. And traditional Chinese medicine has five elements, but it's still largely based on this. Um, so there's a lot of theory about this where they look at the balances in your body. You know, if you have excessive fire, then they may prescribe things that are cooling. If you're too cold and wet, then they're going to be giving you fire remedies. And so this is used quite a bit in medical um, in medical uses. And this was the case in medieval times and up through the Renaissance. And um, what's interesting is that it's more than just medical. They were used to treat things that we might think of as like a, a, the psyche. But beyond that, there were spiritual traditions where they were used to treat life circumstances as well. Um, just, you know, if your life was literally stagnated, then you would want to use something fiery like the spices to pull yourself out of a stagnant patch. Um, okay, so let us go on. Okay, this is of course my, <laughs> I see Saskia. Okay, this is a warning. I, I, Mattel, like I'm using this for didactic purposes. Also, I am a guest lecturer. So anything I say, if I, I get in trouble, it's not my fault. It is not Saskia's fault. Um, but I'm using this as a, a kind of a example about fire. Okay, so. On the right, we have, these are actually really weirdly astrological. On the right, we have the Bob Mackie sun goddess Barbie. <laughs> now, what's interesting about this is that fire is very well known for making people have like a sense of social uh, elevation. In this case, we talk about someone having a dazzling performance as if they're covered in light, which she is literally in this dress. <laughs> and um, there are herbs and spices that are fiery and, and sort of ritual things that people can do, which are thought to actually make them more dazzling. And so this is something that literally people would do. Like for instance, cinnamon is something that's used for this. It's, it's thought to actually improve your social elevation. Um, and on the right-hand side, it's done in a, in a sort of harmonious way. The left-hand Barbie, um, I would call chaotic fire or like hot mess Barbie. Um, and she represents sort of astrologically, she's more of like a Mars um, Barbie. So Mars in astrology was the angry red planet and it's more of a sort of raw version of fire that's a little more out of control and a little more malefic. <laughs> Interestingly enough, she's chain smoking here. This is just sort of a weird coincidence, which I just noticed because um, in astrology, Mars rules over the smell of burnt things, anything that's burnt. So like for instance, I won't go off too much on a tangent, but like a destructive distillation, like a birch tar or something would be very 
uh, uh, Mars or like Cade or something like that. So she's smoking like a crazy number of excessive number of cigarettes. She's got some like whacked out like facial tattoo. And you can see she has a gun. Interestingly enough, Mars is also associated with weapons. So what I'm, what I'm bringing your attention to is that she also has this fire, but it's like a negative attention. And this will come up in a little while because it's thought that some, some of the spices, particularly the peppers, are so fiery that they're a little dangerous to use because you might bring too much fire and it could make you just go off the rails, basically. They are also used in cursing people. There are particular curses using peppers, which are used to make people become very erratic and to look exactly like Hot Mess Barbie. Um, and I'll sort of talk about that as well. So, okay. So hopefully we won't get in trouble from Mattel. So we maybe should move on before they notice that this is on, on here. <laughs> okay. All right. So, okay. So now um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a different sort of archetypal fire. And um, the, uh, on the left is um, uh, a deity, an Orisha um, Ogun. And let me give you a little preamble about this because it's kind of complicated. I will try to do it slowly. I'll try not to use too much jargon, and also if I use too much perfume jargon, please put something in the chat, okay? So, first of all, I am not an elder or priest in any African traditional religious um, sort of tradition. I do have a lot of knowledge of it, and I have studied with people who are um, priests and who have shared a lot about perfume traditions. And I am giving you some information which is sort of basic stuff, if, but it's not very nuanced. So um, you can ask me questions, but I may not be able to answer them perfectly well. But I want to give them to you because these African-derived traditions use a lot of peppers and spices um, in their magical practices, and I think they're interesting. So um, Ogun has different spellings. It would be like O-G-U-N, O-G-U-M, um, in... Uh, in Cuba, in Santeria or Lakumi, um, he is, uh, he, you know, he's very, very important. There's a sister to that, which is known as Palo, in which he would be, um, the name is usually Zarabanda. And then in Haitian, um, Voudon, um, he is a, a deity, a Loa, by the name of Ogon, and there's various manifestations there. There's manifestations in Brazil. Um, but they're all fairly similar. They're usually a man who has a um, large weapon. He's someone who uses fire as a tool. Um, I've noted here he's associated with uh, metallurgy and weapons and tools. Um, he's very associated with peppers. Um, I'll get to this later. Cloves are actually something that are associated with Ogun too. Um, <laughs> and he's really um, this sort of warrior spirit. I write that he has the power to say no. Um, there's this idea that fire can set limits um, and put boundaries on things. Um, as I mentioned before, fire is very destructive, but it can be destructive in a good way when someone uses a scalpel to cut away something that uh, is cancerous and bad. And this is a sort of a feature of this kind of fire. Um, back to the symbolic thing of red, the um, hemoglobin that's in your blood is heme, which is an iron pigment, and he is associated with iron. And um, like I said before, the color red is very much associated with certain um, features of some of these plants and things like red peppers and so on are especially like very, very much associated with these deities. Um, and then at the very bottom, um, there, there are some alignments or resonances between these um, deities and uh, Catholic saints and angels. In particular, um, Ogun is associated with a whole bunch of different saints like St. George and a bunch of other ones, but he is sometimes associated with the Archangel Michael. If you're not like a person who's into angels, um, you know, you can Google a picture of him, but he is generally shown with a big fiery sword. He's, he has different colors, but red and gold are very common. And um, he is like a very scary angel. I mean, he's like a pretty badass. And 
In fact, what's interesting when people who do um, altars and things to Michael, they frequently, as I'll mention later, will use peppers and cloves and things like that. These are all associated with him. There are some other kinds of more obscure peppers, uh, such as grains of paradise and so on that are, that are traditionally associated with the Archangel Michael. Okay, all right, hey, next. I see you nodding. Okay, <laughs> so she is, I, we have mentioned that I'm a doctor. I'm very into the history of medicine. So I pretty much always have to put this up, but um, I really am always interested in letting people know uh, spices and perfumes really used to be medicines and they were also medicines not for your body but they were sort of spiritual medicines so on the left this is maybe hard to see but this figure has a golden sun in um in his chest and traditional in traditionally in um astrology which was taught in medical schools in medieval and renaissance times the heart was ruled by the sun and the Latin for heart is core, which you'll, you know, obviously, cor you know, coronary and that sort of thing. Um, but it literally was kind of like the core of your body. Um, and a lot of medical treatments um, focused on um, bringing warmth and um, light to your heart in order to increase your general well-being. And they were sometimes seen more or less as panaceas. So spices were often given to people to increase their sun energy in their heart um and i mentioned here it improves your appetite for life so literally it was given to people for poor appetite it was also given to people who sort of like just don't have an appetite for life people who just are, lose interest in things you know you would prescribe spices with the idea that it would increase a sense of joy that they would be able to be more interested in like life and that sort of thing and these were the basis of cordials. Uh, I had a class before that um, focused a lot on spiritual colognes, and I have one coming up on lemons, where I'll talk about cordials again because they're really interesting. Um, people nowadays see cordials as these really fancy liqueurs. I'm really glad that there's people here from Italy because I know you know people can still get these amazing cordials in places like Florence that are made by nuns. They're very traditional. What they were is they were these medicinal liqueurs that had lots of ingredients. They had a lot of spices. They frequently were colored red or sometimes gold. They would sometimes add saffron to make them yellow, or they, in fact, sometimes even use gold flakes. Um, and cordials were made in monasteries, um, and this is sort of an interesting point. Monasteries, a lot of people may not know, were um, had infirmaries. They were very focused on treating the ill. And a lot of monasteries had distilleries or uh, like what would be called a, um, dist like a little distillation or still room. Um, and there's a lot of archeological evidence that says that, in fact, they're really surprised how many of them had um, fairly advanced distillation equipment, glass equipment, um, so they can distill things for their medicines. Um, and they would prepare these for people. Obviously the really fancy ones were more for like wealthy people. Um, but these were prepared it, from things from their gardens often because uh, monasteries had herb gardens and they had um, libraries and they preserved a lot of herbal knowledge, um, you know, like ancient Roman herbal knowledge and preserved a lot of fragrant plants as well. Um, and in the next slide, we'll see this is the basis for some clones. So this is one of my favorite ones. It's Carmelite water. You can see up here, it is Boyer's Carmelite, Melissa Cordial, um, Eau de Melisse de Cam. Um, and this was a famous uh, one made by the uh, Carmelite order in Paris. Um, so some of this is cut off, but it was, um, it was like about a hundred years before um, the advent of colognes. And so this is a common, um, uh, a commonly give, given recipe. Obviously, this isn't the whole thing, but because it's secret, but it generally was made with lemon balm and lemon peel. The lemons were thought to be very solar because they were like, you know, these round things that looked like the sun. And um, so they were sort of color coded to be solar. And then a bunch of uh, 
hot kinds of spices, nutmeg, coriander, clove, cinnamon, angelica, which I'm not really talking about, which is also thought to be kind of hot. And they were in wine spirits. So what they would do is that they would get uh, wines and brandies and they would distill them down to what we now call like uh, uh, grape alcohol, which a lot of um, natural perfumers use. Um, and you have to understand that you could, of course, drink these because it was grape alcohol. It was very common that people would splash them on their heads and apply them to their skin. And <laughs> surprise, surprise, like this lemony thing with spices in it was the basis basically of very, the, the very early um, clones, which also kind of had these um, curative, cure-all spiritual um, um, things. <laughs> Not to get too much into clones, let me have a sip of tea. But clones didn't really take off until you could do more commercial scale distillations like in Germany, where you could do a large scale and you could scale up because these were really super tiny things. But these were used for, you know, kind of spiritual healing and physical healing and people splashed them on themselves and consumed them. Um, and these had spices because they're thought to be very beneficial for that. Okay, next. Okay. This is a really horrifying picture. I'm gonna just say I chose it and it creates an aesthetic terror in me <laughs> because it's so twee. But um, I chose it because it illustrates a point in medieval and Renaissance medicine. Um, you see here, there's a lot of gold colors. This is a wintry scene. There's a lot of golds and oranges. And you can see in front of you a hot beverage. There's cinnamon, there's some star anise, uh, God knows what else. Um, and traditionally, the reason why you would have spices in the winter is because the winter was cold and wet. And so the way to overcome that was by having things that are hot and dry. And not only were they supposed to like clear up your mucousy chest, but they were also meant to um, improve your sort of internal fires, which would make you more joyful. And this is the basis of a lot of midwinter celebrations where people were very cold in which you would engage in, in um, eating spices to kind of remind you of the sun because they're very much associated with the sun. Um, so this was a medical suggestion that just became part of popular culture and continues to be part of popular culture. And even in perfume circles, I always find it interesting that people are very into seasonal perfumes. I mean, in California, it's not that big a deal, but people want to wear comfort sits in the winter. They want to have things that are warm. Um, so this is sort of like built into a lot of our culture. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see, what are we doing with time? We're doing fine. All right, so here is something that I chose because it reminds me of an elementary school textbook where you would learn about the adventures of Christopher Columbus and all those people who were you know, going out to discover the new world. As you may recall, Columbus was out there looking for this, a shortcut to the Spice Islands. The Spice Islands um, have very valuable spices like nutmegs and cloves. And um, so, it, it, and Mandy mentions this in the book. So the story of spices, which uh, I, I'm not going to go into the antiquity parts of it because I don't want to go too off track, but the story of spices is really interesting. And in fact, um, it's fascinating because there are certain plants that seem to drive human behavior most of them actually have a pharmacological action. I mean, things obviously like tobacco and like, you know, opium have a pharmacological action, but in the case of spices, they don't. It's really purely pleasure. People love them so much that they do crazy ass things and travel uh, across the world not knowing where they're going. Um, and it's an interesting story which translates into some of their, what they're used for in magical traditions. So in this case, I say that it's the story of trade, which interesting is that the whole spice trade <laughs> basically is, is absolutely collected to all kinds of things um, involving um, the first banking systems and all sorts of things like that. People made absolutely staggering amounts of money on this, or they faced huge risks, like entire fleets of ships just disappeared. Um, 
you know, it was all sort of very adventurous and swashbuckling. As you can see, it's very coded to be like a male only environment, obviously. Um, and then there's the dark side of this, obviously, because of the spice trade, we have genocide and slavery, and we have these like mass movements of people. Um, and it's sort of fascinating because these code into what people use for spices. So first of all, spices are used for gambling. Um, I showed you the essential oil of nutmeg and I'll get to that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, nutmeg is a famous gambling charm. It seems that spices just are encoded for like taking big risks. And in fact, using them apparently is supposed to make you lucky when you take big risks. They're also encoded for business success because I will talk about especially a lot of Southern root work and stuff like that, where people use cinnamon for their businesses um, in order to ensure uh, customers and success and that sort of thing. They are um, very well known as money attractors. A lot of uh, money spells and so on use them. And then the flip side of it is that they are sometimes used for cursing, usually peppers. Um, that's sort of the whole side of it, of it, you know, them being very negative and the association with um, genocide, obviously. So fiery things like spices have this, this reputation that they may people move and transform. Um, they're, they're highly associated in some systems with crossroad spirits um, who basically are trickstery and they get you to move. And if you have any kind of dealings with them, your whole life will change really quickly, either for good or bad. It's kind of hard to say. Um, so, um, hold on. Okay. So, um, all right. Yeah. Next slide. <coughs> okay. All right. So I love this advertisement. Okay. The reason I love it is to me, if someone just put this down in front of me, it really reminds me of a tarot card. It's very iconic. So what it is, um, poivre is a word that means pepper. And this is a uh, perfume that was made by Caron in 1954. Um, if you're not a perfume person, Caron is one of the great classic French perfume houses that was founded like, I think around 1904 or 1905. It's responsible for a lot of these femme fatale, um, very famous scents like Narcisse Noir, which is Black Narcissus, and a couple other ones. Um, and uh, this is a really interesting one because it's very, very spicy. Um, it is in a fragrance family, which if you have not um, heard about fragrance families, it's this way in which people categorize um, fragrances. It can be very hard to understand if no one's explained it to you, but basically um, orientals often have um, like amber, vanilla, woods. They're, they're kind of soft. They frequently have spices. Um, and obviously this looks very uh, sort of stereotypically oriental. The word oriental also codes into this whole idea of um, Orientalism, which um, I can give you the very brief definition of, but there's an incredibly famous book by Edward Said called S-A-I-D, called Orientalism. It's basically this concept that the Orient is basically this kind of colonialist construct that's created by, you know, wealthy Western people who have a, an exotic uh, view of uh, Eastern and foreign countries where they basically see them as mysterious as like an exotic other. So this, this particular advertisement is sort of showing us all these things about spices, which I was just talking about. It has a dragon, it's all in red and gold. So obviously there's this whole mythological thing that spices are mysterious. Um, this particular one, I've only, I personally have only spelled um, the vintage version because I knew someone who had a, a collection of vintage Caron and it was like this really, really stunning clove monster that was a clove and carnation with a lot of incense and woods. The notes that they list are red and black pepper. Um, they list carnation for people who don't know, carnation is often kind of a, they may use carnation absolute, but it's frequently something that is bouquet with various kind of clovey sorts of notes. 
um, um, Ylang Ylang, Apopanox, Sandalwood, Vitterber, Oak Moss. Um, I, I will get to this and I didn't really talk about it too much, but, um, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about it now. So the um, clove is, a lot of the clove fragrances have had to be reformulated because they have something called eugenol in them. This is something that's highly restricted um, because it could be a, sin, a skin sensitizer. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is like this incredible clove fragrance and it's kind of this grand thing for the 1950s. Um, but it really illustrates this whole mythical side of, of uh, spices that they were like kind of like living dragons. Okay, next. Okay, so now we'll start getting into these. I have no idea what this is. This is, in fact, maybe someone from Italy can tell me. This was an Italian cologne called Homme de Cayenne like Pepperman, and it has this very kind of manly bottle. And I'm just using it as example because it's kind of fun. Um, so there are, there are cayenne notes listed in fragrances. I am highly skeptical that any of them have real cayenne. There are um, some uh, red pepper, uh, like extracts and so on, which are ap apparently approved for cosmetic uses, but it's a very tricky thing because it causes your skin to burn, obviously. Um, but it is a popular um, note in fragrances, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, how it's used in sort of uh, traditional spiritual and religious and magical traditions, because it has like a ton of things associated with it. Okay, so next. Okay, I'm gonna give you, this is a um, Southern formula. This is very Narlands, um, hoodoo, conjure, root work. These are all Southern folk magic. So this is a formula called flying devil. So um, according to various sources, the kind of basic formula was <coughs> cayenne flakes and olive oil. And you would shake them up and they'd fly around like little flying devils. Um, this was used generally for um, very negative things, for like cursing people. You would put it someplace where someone would touch it and it would basically mess with someone and make them leave. Um, it could also be used for heavy protection, like you just wanted to keep negative people away. Um, and there are other uses too. So peppers are often used basically to create boundaries and make people go away. Um, there's a famous southern formula that usually usually is a powder, but sometimes can be <coughs> used in other formulations called hot foot, which is basically a way of getting rid of people you don't want to be around. Like say if someone's stalking you, you would hot foot them, or you had like a totally horrible neighbor who abused your dog, you could hot foot them and make them go away. Um, and there were more extreme versions of pepper things. There's a very famous formula <clears throat> from Haiti called Pika Pika. Um, they're kind of like little watered down versions of this. This is generally a powder. <clears throat> the powder is made with peppers and things that make you itch, as well as extremely horrible caustic things. And it was used to curse people who'd done very, very bad things. Um, this was usually part of some secret society that would um, look for people who are beyond the law, who had done something really terrible. And if they touched this Pika Pika powder with the peppers in it, um, it would be a terrible curse and frequently had other kinds of unpleasant things like rotting corpses and stuff like that in it. But peppers were here used again to just, this is sort of the max beyond 10 level of get out of here um, would be the Pika Pika. Um, and it does give us this hint. Peppers were aligned a lot with cemetery spirits. And um, in Haiti, the cemetery spirits were mostly um, Gede or, or um, the Barons, Berrand. Um, and these were spirits who you, people are familiar with this from like that James Bond movie where they had, you know, these like <clears throat> spirits in top coats with like dark glasses and kind of these Masonic regalia and so on. Um, and cemetery spirits are um, obviously scary, but they're also known to be very healing. And um, there's this whole tradi tradition that when they come down and they possess people, they drink rum that's infused with really, really hot peppers. 
<laughs> things that normally people couldn't drink. Um, and peppers are used in some of the um, work with them and also in sort of healing work as well. Um, and this to me kind of ties into peppers, <coughs> excuse me, because the substance capsaicin, which is in cayenne peppers, is what you find in pepper spray. So not surprisingly, pepper is basically a chemical weapon. It is used in these formulas like hot foot to get rid of people, but this is what um, you know they use to disperse crowds. It's basically capsaicin. Um, and capsaicin is also a medicine. It's used in capsaicin cream, which is the topical cream that people use for some sorts of pain, like for um, arthritic pains and for some other neurologists and so on. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, you can go buy this over the counter now, a long time ago, it used to be by prescription, but basically it causes a, a burning sensation. And then at some point it causes, um, it has an impact on something called substance P, which um, it is, is something that modulates pain. And um, it's very interesting. I, I tie this in a little bit with some aspect of going back to uh, the slide we saw before, thinking about the warrior spirits um, who are associated with peppers because this, this is sort of like, peppers actually give you ability to feel no pain in a certain way, which is something that literally happens when people have an adrenaline, uh, an adrenaline surge when they're like, uh, you know, basically going full warrior, your brain actually does not perceive pain because it's a perceptual thing. So the peppers are actually thought to help protect you from certain types of pain. And um, this again shows us the spices being both uh, medicines and also weapons at the same time. Okay, next. All right, so just of course I have to bring in some perfumery. So, um, so we got Comme de Garçon, which is, oh wait, you have to nod. It, it would be considered niche, right? Yes, okay. So Comme de Garçon, if you're not familiar with it, is, um, you know, the clothes are like, oh my God, they're amazing. Sadly, I can probably not afford them very often or at all. Um, but their fragrances um, oftentimes take risks and use unusual ingredients. Um, and they have entire series and so on that focus on, on specific things. They had a series called Red, which did focus on a lot of spices. A couple of those are still available. They have another one called Black that had black pepper, but this one, black pepper, is like, you know, a lot of black pepper. Um, and black pepper is used in fine fragrance. I really like it. It has like all these incredible woody nuances and so on. I like black pepper with woods like sandalwood. Um, but here's an example that things that have been around for thousands of years um, sort of fall out of use and become trendy again. And, um, and besides Comme de Garçon, there's several other, um, you know, fragrance houses that kind of got on the pepper wagon for a while, a couple years ago. Um, so they are used in fine fragrances. Okay, next. Black pepper is a, I would describe black pepper as something that is similar to red pepper, um, but not as gnarly and horrible. And um, it is, uh, it's also used in these things like uh, that are called getaway, like various sorts of fragrances and so on and so forth. Um, and then it's also used in a sense, as I, if you recall the hot mess Barbie, there are some curses that they do on people where they um, may, do things with peppers in order to make the person kind of unstable and hot-headed and taking risks so that they kind of go off the rails. Um, and there are other types of pepper things they do. If you really want someone to go away, they may just wander for years. Like it's almost like they can't keep their feet anywhere because they're sort of peppered up, which is an interesting um, thing. But um, Black peppers are also used for the positive things I mentioned before. They were really big in medieval medicine. They're certainly super used in Ayurvedic medicine. They're thought to be very warming. And so they have, you know, very positive qualities as well. Okay, next. All right, so this is, okay, so we're on our next thing. So we're on allspice now. So allspice, it's interesting. Um, Perfume people 
often don't like to use certain names. They use more fancified names because they're more glamorous. So I was always really confused. I did not know what a pabinta berry was for the longest time. It's just a name for allspice because I guess allspice sounds boring. But all, allspice is, is a pimenta. Um, and then its cousin, um, uh, which is the bay rum tree, is pimenta racemosa, not to be too confusing. But there's a whole bunch of things called bay. There's bay laurel and there's California bay trees. But there's the West Indies tree called bay rum is pimenta racemosa. It is very similar to allspice. Um, and in ye olden days, they would actually distill the leaves of uh, pimenta racemosa directly into rum. Um, obviously, that's not something they do now. Um, but the leaves are still used in um, Jamaican cuisine. If you live somewhere where you have a Jamaican neighborhood like in New York, you can get them. Otherwise, they're really hard to, to get. I know people in um, Miami, like people, who, Lakumi people and stuff who like to use them, but they, they say it's kind of hard to find the trees. But anyway, um, getting back to allspice, allspice was one of the primary spices used in this very famous cologne, Bay Rum, which generally was Bay Rum leaves with allspice, with clove, with cinnamon, and then uh, some kind of citrus. It would generally be either orange or bergamot, and then whatever. There sometimes could be some ginger, sometimes it'd be lime, but it, this was the basic formula allspice, bay rum, clove, cinnamon, citrus. Um, so this is a um, classic cologne, which I don't, um, you know, it's not like you see it that much anymore, except that I think it was Dior just did like this, up, I know, yeah, Dior did this really crazy upscale bay rum recently. I forget what it's called. It was just basically bay rum, but it's like $200. Um, but I'm sure it was really good. So, oh, I shouldn't have said, I hope that's not, I hope Dior is not mad. Anyway, um, <laughs> so Bay Rum is a cologne and it's what we call a spiritual cologne because some perfumes and products that are colognes mysteriously for reasons we don't understand get co-opted by uh, spiritual healers and they use them a lot. Now, the one we all know about um, that people have heard about is Florida water. And we have a hopefully rescheduled class coming up on Florida, how to make your own Florida water. Um, but Bay Rum was one <laughs> that was used for a long time. And it remains really big in Puerto Rico and Cuba for people who practice Espiritismo. What that is, is a spiritual tradition, which is kind of related to spiritualism. It involves people being open to various spirit guides. They often have these um, meetings where they have altars and they work with various like angels and spirit guides. And they frequently have big balls of cologne there. They, they like to use bay rum and they'll use it to splash on people to purify them. Um, also when they do consultations, which would be like say like a card reading or a consultation, <laughs> they often use bay rum in between people, almost like a doctor would wash their hands um, in between patients, they'll splash bay rum to kind of purify themselves between clients. Um, and it's like one of these kind of multi-tools where it's good for like everything. It's very protective and healing, but it also brings good luck. And <laughs> a lot of times um, these practitioners will have bay rum and they'll put some of their own herbs and things in it and use them. Um, but it's like one of their favorite things to use. All right. So allspice is good for all of those things. Okay. Next. All right. Let's see. Do I need to stop for questions? I only see two things. So should I just power on? Probably. What are you saying? Yes. Okay. Um, I think, I think let's take some questions for a minute. Do you agree? Okay. Hold on. Let's see. Um, yeah. It's like, what time is it? It's seven ish. <laughs> yeah. Do we want to take a question? I'm putting your video back on. Oh God, wait. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Does um, anybody have any questions? Or just a five minute quick question break? Hey, all right, now I have to sit up and not slump. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, let me know, cause I'll just get to the end. 
Okay, I think I was wrong. I think no one has any questions. All right, is it that bad? <laughs> no, it's that good. All right, James, we're turning your video back off, so slump away and I'll, I'll switch back to screen share. Later. Stop video, here we go, screen share. Okay, as we were. Uh, okay, there we go, all right. Okay, so next is, um, okay, so next you see here this, this, I don't know, I didn't do a good job with this picture. So what we have here, are what we would call cinnamon sticks, um, but technically <laughs> pretty much anything you can possibly buy in a store is really cassia. It's just their cousins. Um, uh, cinnamon is cinnamon verum and cassia. There's a whole bunch of cassias, but my understanding is the United States, it's mostly this uh, Vermonti that people can get. Um, if you read um, Mandy's book, she has a lot about cassia and cinnamon. Um, and in antiquity, it's really hard to know. Um, you can read all sorts of things about ancient Egyptian uses of cinnamon and uses in Rome and so on. It's really unclear whether they were really using cassia or true cinnamon. True cinnamon is much, much more, more expensive. Um, <coughs> uh, it does smell slightly different. As I had mentioned, there's a little more coumarin in the cassia. Um, but if you get a really amazing cinnamon essential oil, it can be like sort of stratospherically like superior. It can have a lot of floral qualities and kind of powdery qualities that the cassia doesn't have. Um, okay. So next, okay, so I'm gonna talk about cinnamon and I'm gonna talk about New Orleans in the late 1920s. And I'm gonna talk about some work uh, by Zora Neale Hurston, um, who is this great writer in the Harlem Renaissance um, who wrote um, Mules and Men and a bunch of other books. And she um, <laughs> was quite amazing. She was an anthropologist and um, she did research in the South in the late 20s. Um, and she, uh, next slide for me. Okay, so she came out with this uh, article in the early 30s um, called Hoodoo in America. She had been very fortunate. There was some super wealthy uh, Manhattan person who paid for her to go to the South to do field work and what they would consider folklore at the time. Um, and she was able to spend a couple of years there and probably this was like done like around 28 or so, but it didn't, I don't think the article came out until 30 or 31. This is an article if you have access to things like JSTOR or academic databases you can get. Um, it's really quite amazing because it has a lot of herbal stuff in it. And I've, I've used it before in classes because I think it's interesting because it really gives you, you know, a picture of that time. Just to give people a little background who are not familiar with this, um, there are a lot of African spiritual and herbal traditions that have, um, th that are followed the, um, you know, African diasporic uh, currents throughout the world. And so they show up in um, Haiti, they show up in Cuba. In this case, they show up in the South, in New Orleans, <laughs> and they form the practices which people, you can see at the very bottom here, she has this word, like a, a voodoo is spelled V-E-A-U-D-E-A-U. -E -E so um, nowadays, most people refer to these things as either New Orleans voodoo, or it could be hoodoo, or conjure, or root work. They're basically um, a group of practices, um, which I don't want to get into too much detail because it's so technical, but people used a lot of perfumes and incenses. It was a really big deal. Um, in the spiritual work, and um, they use a lot of spices. So I'm going to give some examples. I had already mentioned one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, cinnamon was like, or, which would be cassia, um, was super popular for business success. And so there's a whole bunch of formulas about that. And they would use it in various ways. Sometimes they would burn cinnamon in a place of business. Another thing they would do, which is interesting, is they would put cinnamon and sugar and other things in their mop water, and they would mop the uh, floor of the place, and sometimes they would mop the sidewalk in front, and it was thought to bring in customers to the place of business. And, you know, sometimes these were respectable things like churches, but other times they were um, sort of demimond things like 
places where there's gambling or brothels or places like that. Um, so today I am going to, if you look here in the middle, um, it says New Orleans Catholic, and there's a little line there that says Ruth Mason. So the next one, I'm going to talk about Ruth Mason, the next slide. So Ruth Mason was um, someone that she spent time with, and Ruth taught her some of her recipes. Um, and this is one called To Uncross. So the whole concept of uncrossing is one in which when people, <laughs> I sort of probably should have tried to explain this better, but in a lot of spiritual traditions, um, they look at bad life circumstances almost like an illness. So in other words, if you had really gossipy people that you worked with who are always backbiting, they would not see that as a psychosocial problem or like a hostile workplace environment. They could possibly see that almost like an illness, an illness that could be treated you know, using certain types of spell work and spiritual work. Um, in this case, if you're crossed, it just meant that a lot of stuff just wasn't working for you. You kept feeling blocked, like things just weren't going forward, um, and they would need to uncross you. So in this case, she gives a prescription for that. So put some whole cloves and whole spice. Now, um, this could either mean... Um, just whatever spice you had around the house, but also it could mean pumpkin pie spices. Um, I will let people Google pumpkin pie spices, especially people from Italy, <laughs> to know what they are, but they are a traditional group of spices, which is usually like allspice, nutmeg, cinnamon, ginger. Some, there's some variations there. So it was probably cloves plus pumpkin pie spices. Lump incense is Russian lump incense and again you're welcome to look that up but in um in stores or internet stores that carry um or orthodox materials such as um, church incenses for very long periods of time for hundreds of years you could buy something called russian lump incense you can still buy it it's basically big old chunks of frankincense so that basically means cloves mixed spice and frankincense you put these into a saucer and it's understood that there would be charcoal there and you smoke the party so they did not use the word smudge or whatever word we use now they use words like fumigate or smoke which is basically to use incense for um smoking a person or a place or occasionally they would also use incense to smoke things so the person would stand over the incense and they said here set the saucer on the floor and have him stand in the smoke this is like super african because there's a bunch of african traditions where people stand over smoking incense um uh in places like senegal and so on they have all these traditions where women take like different roots and pour perfumed oils and stand over them so this seems to be definitely a very african tradition that's translated into new orleans um so you do this for nine days. You also have a bath of cinnamon brewed before the smoke. I've already warned you, you should be really careful about spices, but I suppose if you brewed a tiny bit and put a little bit in the bath, um, this is something that they suggested. And this is a treatment for lack of friends or lack of attention from the other sex. So if a person was very lonely and they just felt like they couldn't meet people and their life was really stalled, you would do this particular thing with spices. Now, hopefully this extremely long preamble has helped you like get that so spices make you literally spicy like kind of sexy so this is supposed to sex you up it was supposed to make you more hot literally like more hot like people would pay attention to you it's supposed to elevate your social um status and to make people pay attention to you because that's what spices do is this is this like totally nonsense or people like kind of grasping the thing Okay, yeah, so without me doing the preamble, it might be a little mysterious why a clove could make you sexy, but this kind of gives you a little idea that makes you fiery, and so you're hot. Okay, next. Okay, next. This is a super famous formula. It's probably, in New Orleans lore, it's one of the most famous lucky formula. It's called Red Fast Luck, and uh, this is mentioned in her writings but it's also mentioned in other writings and red fast luck is cinnamon 
vanilla, and wintergreen. Yes, there are no proportions, like they just don't give that. They just tell you what's in it. I can tell you, this smells super fantastic. It really is like this fantastic root beer kind of smell. And um, you could use it as an oil or as an incense. Um, and people would use it on themselves, on objects that would burn the incense. The idea is that it's fast because the color red is fiery. It makes things come really fast. And the cinnamon is kind of the activator here. The other two ingredients are also considered lucky in different ways. Um, and we have a saint next to this. Um, saint Expedite is a uh, very interesting saint. He is one of these saints who is really a real saint, um, but kind of got decanonized at some point. And um, he is exactly what he sounds like. He expedites stuff. He makes things come really fast. You pray to him when you need stuff in a hurry. Like say your car breaks down and you're like, oh my God, I don't have $500. Oh, help me, say expedite. You would like light a candle to him, do some fast look incense. Um, and then do some other things, like he likes Sara Lee pound cake, just in case you want to know. You can read about him on the internet. Now, he, for various reasons, he's very big in New Orleans. It was a really huge thing there. I have no idea how this has happened, but the last time I was in Paris, I walked into a church, and I was walking around, and I saw this one chapel that had like a million candles. This was in Paris, and the whole chapel was like St. Expedite. I was like, what is this? So apparently, he's taken off in Europe, too. I think it's an odd thing where um, a uh, kind of a religious practice from the States is like migrated back to Europe. So, but anyway, so this is Red Fast Luck, which is a very spicy, famous thing. Okay, next. Um, here, this is really interesting to me. Him is this Indian incense maker that's been around forever. Like they have a fast luck incense too. Like obviously this is like a genre that everyone wants to be on board with. Um, and I can tell you there's other fast look formulas that also use spices like allspice or nutmeg. It just seems like spices are, are associated with fast luck. Um, and it's just kind of a weird phenomena that now this Indian company has their own fast luck too. Okay, next. This <clears throat> is another fast luck formula. Hopefully you can read it. This is from the New Orleans Pharmacy Museum. So this is an incredible museum because it has lots of perfumes and medicines and essential oils. I highly recommend it. This is from an old formulary they have there. So people used to go to the pharmacy and buy their supplies for magical things too. And they had a little book that had formulas in it. This one, and it's unclear how old it is because I don't see anyone dating it just based on the handwriting and stuff. It's at least, you know, probably late 19th century or early 20th century at least. Um, so this fast lick formula is cinnamon bergamot and it says verbena or lemongrass. Um, there's like no way it's actually verbena because verbena even then was like 10 times more expensive than lemongrass. So it was probably lemongrass. There was sort of a thing that they called essence of verbena, which was just lemongrass. Um, and the proportions, I have, you know what? I can't remember exactly what this is. The little squiggly thing means ounce. I think it means a half ounce. And then the alcohol looks like it's four ounces and it's 10 cents an ounce. So this is interesting. It's a historical recipe for another fast luck thing, <laughs> which also had cinnamon in it. Okay, next. Okay, now cloves. Um, so the word clou means a nail, and it's the basis for the word cl uh, clove. Um, interestingly enough, I had mentioned Cuba, there is a practice of uh, palo, which is a spiritual tradition, which uses a lot of palo, which means like sticks, it uses a lot of wood and herbs, and their name for clove is Palo Clavo, and Palo Clavo is associated with um, the spirit that's like Ogun, who's Zarabanda. So clove is thought to be particularly sacred to you know fire and people who work with fire. Um, it is supposed to clear your path. Like if there's things that are just blocking you, you use cloves. Um, it's used for a combination of domination and love, like kind of more like you really need to sort of take charge sorts of stuff. Um, money issues. This one, um, 
is used in a lot of stuff, stop gossip formulas. So if you go to botanicas, you'll sometimes see these candles that are really weird that show like this woman with like her mouth like taped up and it will say tapa la boca or whatever. And so there are certain things that are thought to keep people from gossiping. I have heard people who use this, they use clove, like for instance, if they work in a gossipy workplace, they will use clove and or cinnamon and put a little dab like on their um, sweater or something to kind of just vibe people out um, to keep them away. So it stops gossip. It's used in very heavy cleansings, which I'll talk about in a minute, like just to really grow super negative stuff. Um, I had talked about Archangel Michael, um, cloves and orange, like in fact, um, pomanders, which interestingly enough, originally were used against the plague or oranges studded with cloves. They're used um, um, on the altar sometimes because they're sacred to Michael. And then another little factoid, which is kind of cool, all of us are familiar with clove cigarettes from art school. <laughs> and so, you know, they're art school clove cigarettes. In fact, it, Indonesian healers do use them sometimes in spiritual healing. <laughs> Instead of smudging you down with a uh, sage, they would use a clove cigarette and pass it over your body as a spiritual cleaning. So I actually think this is far cooler. and I think we should all move back towards clove cigarettes instead of sage. <laughs> all right, next. Okay, so this is, we have to have an exorcism incense because of course. Um, so this is just an example of using cloves for exorcism. Um, this is like a really fascinating thing, which I could go off on a giant tangent, but there was in late 19th century France, there was something called the occult revival where all these people were into spiritualism and mesmerism and all kinds of mystical things. So a lot of people were into strange and diabolic things. And this sort of defrocked priest named the Abbe Boulon was very famous and circulated in literary circles. Um, and um, he had this specific incense that um, he gave to this famous writer named Heismans who wrote this book on, um, on the black mass called La Ba that was like incredibly influential in a lot of poets and stuff. But anyway, so the, the incense itself is dedicated to St. John the Baptist, which is interesting because John's day is midsummer. I didn't talk about this, but there's a lot of timing associated with these things. And midsummer is the most fiery time of the year in the, uh, where we live and in Paris. And um, so not surprisingly, fiery incenses are, are often made at this time. It's a very lucky kind of time. And this is frankincense, myrrh, cloves, and camphor. And you would basically make it into like a little paste that you would put uh, dry and put on um, charcoal. And it was thought to remove negative spirits that were being sent to you, um, you know, like demons and things like that, or could exercise someone. Okay, next. All right. So I'm just throwing this in here as a standalone thing just to talk about ginger. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about ginger. This is just, I didn't really talk about like technical aspects of stuff, but this, this um, fragrance is by Ernst Bo, who was a, uh, a Russian immigre in the 1920s, who is most famous for being the perfumer behind number five. Um, but he made an, a number of other fragrances um, for Chanel. And this was Bois des Îles, which is like, you know, island wood or wood of the islands or whatever, uh, forest, island forest, I guess, um, which is not to go into great details, but it has this absolutely beautiful use of, uh, of a gingerbread accord. It's this kind of tonker, tonka ginger, uh, soft benzoin kinds of thing. It's really an example of like a classic French perfumery that uses extremely subtle uses of uh, spices to create this kind of warmth. Um, and, and again, um, ginger, like the other things, is associated with this. Okay, so next. Okay, so here's a really fun spell, a dinner party spell to enhance the social charisma of a room. So um, we would call this environmental fragrancing. Nowadays, people use candles, they use diffusers, they use sprays, but in the olden days, people would use incense. And so 
This is a spell that is cast upon a room, and this is actually a thing where you basically uh, enchant an entire room to influence everyone in the room. Um, dinner parties, I guess they still are, but once upon a time, were very important to advance your social standing. Like if you're an artist and you were like inviting over some gallery owners and some important buy, you know, other people, you would want them to be really happy during your dinner party and to be like enchanted by you. So this is from a very interesting book. I can find out almost nothing about this person. He lived in Spain and says that he learned a lot of this from Romani people, like old gypsy women he described them as. Um, and they do kind of look, uh, like they might be uh, real. But anyway, he describes these as things he had learned. And this particular spell is you add ginger to sandalwood cedar um, and you burn this not just before dinner. He's like, you know, you have to do this like a couple hours ahead of time so it doesn't like make the room all smoky. But you want the room to have this sort of subtle gingery sandalwood cedar thing. Um, and you light these candles, these white and blue candles. Um, and then it creates this atmosphere that enchants your guests so that your social status is going to be enhanced because they have a great time. So, okay, next. Okay, now back to India. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about um, an enchanted chai spell. So everyone is familiar from fairy tales and such is the where you give someone something to drink and they fall in love with you. Well. This is actually an incredibly ancient thing. In India, there are these traditions that honestly, they go back thousands of years as I showed you the photograph of the fire ritual. There are um, particular practices where you burn things along with mantras to get certain effects. And I think most people are, are familiar from yoga class of doing like a sort of Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. That's like a peaceful mantra meant to calm you down, but there are an entire other types of mantras that are meant to heat you up and have um, more of a manipulative effect. There are these magical acts that are described, and there's not a lot of this in English. Um, I actually, when I went to India, I was able to find some books that talked about using herbs in some of these ways. So this particular type of tantric action is called Vashikaran, and it mostly translates as to subjugating and enslaving. It's basically a very heavy domination. Um, the, they often uh, give us an example of the uh, wife who has the wayward husband who's lost interest in her. So this sort of justifies her re-enchanting him by doing one of these spells. And this particular one would use um, cardamom but I've also seen ones that use clove and peppers and other kinds of spices. <clears throat> and basically what you would do, in case you wanna try it, <laughs> but I'm not gonna give you the mantra, okay? Um, you would put the spices in your armpit because you had to sweat on them to kind of like give them your personal essence. Then you would pound them down, you would make them into a powder, you would do this often with a red cloth, um, wearing red clothes, um, and you would add goat smoke because goats are very kind of have a special kind of vibe to them. And um, <clears throat> you would do this whole ritual action and you would um, make like the spiced tea and you would serve it to your husband. And as he inhaled the beautiful fragrance of it, he would fall under your power and would be somewhat submissive to you. There's also versions of this that use um, uh, atars and stuff and they would put it on your forehead in order to give you an enchanted gaze so that for instance <clears throat> if you were to go to an important person like a king that would be completely captivated by you because you would be you know hot sexy scintillating and they would kind of want to do what you said um and these oftentimes use spices too and interestingly enough they would sometimes do vashikran on wild animals to kind of calm them down so that they could get them to do what they wanted to do Okay, so, well, you know what, it is 7.30, so probably, do you think we should do questions now? I mean, I have other stuff that people want. I don't, let's just ask people what they want me to do, because I've just been gabbing. Um, okay, I'm not sure, let's see, I'm going to stop share and go over to the chat, because I can't do both. Okay. All right, folks, um, does anybody have any questions? So, I went through an awful lot of stuff, okay? <laughs> I hope that it's not incomprehensible. Um, 
I, and if people have questions about certain stuff, I mean, did you have some things you wanted to ask or? What's the mantra? Um, <laughs> I can't tell you because you might not use it correctly. I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, the mantras, in case you want to know, a lot of times are really complicated and sometimes you have to do them for months. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'll find other ways to subjugate my husband. <laughs> <laughs> but you could try the chai. <laughs> okay. um, Leona, it's cool that you can still find that uh, cordial. Um, yeah, actually, if you go, I remember when I was in Florence, there are still some cordials that are traditionally prepared and, you know, you can get them there. Um, Santa Maria Novella in Florence still makes some incredible cordials. Some of them are, um, there's one that's called, I think it's A-L-K-E-R-N-E-S. It's kind of has a red color. It's like a famous cordial, I believe, that they make. <clears throat> what is Janine saying? I'm sorry, I have to pop up here. Hi, uh Janine. Um, I keep seeing sandalwood paired with these spices. Is there some sort of solar lunar balance? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I didn't want to go into astrology because it would take me like an extra like 12 hours. But um, the answer to that is yes. So um, I think I gave you an idea that these spices are hot, but you have to be a little cautious. And I didn't really get into the technical aspects of this, but when you use spices in cooking, Obviously, you have to use very tiny amounts because you would dominate things and it would be inedible. In perfumery, you also, well, partly because of regulations, you can't use a lot of these spices in great amounts, but just for aesthetic reasons, you frequently use, need to use very small amounts of them and pair them with other things. So in these kind of magical actions, a lot of times they don't want stuff to be too, too hot because we'll make people just go completely crazy. And so they sometimes pair them with stuff that's a little bit more neutral or, or calming. So that, that is a thing. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, what is it? Sarah and Accord. Oh, you were, I'm sorry. Did I use the word Accord and I didn't define it? I knew I would do that. Okay. Yes. Um, let's see. Sandwich. This is from Accord on Venice. You can still put Accordials. Um, are you doing work on magic in the Muslim world? So yes, I didn't include that. Um, there's a huge amount of stuff uh, like in uh, Moroccan magic and so on that uses spices. I didn't go into coriander, which is used a lot. And there's an entire thing of like Moroccan magic that people do. A lot of it involves the jinn. Um, not surprisingly, the jinn who are like genie are fiery spirits. Um, uh, uh, coriander is the, there's a name for it. It's called apple of the gin, and a lot of times it's used in incense that you burn for the gin um, because they like it. And um, there's these all these different practices of incenses and stuff that they use um, in, in magic. And I didn't get into some of the other technical stuff, but a lot of times there are a lot of ritual actions. I, I didn't get into this, but these incense burnings and things are um, associated with various ritual actions. For instance, <laughs> if you were doing some sort of altar for someone, um, an angel or something, you might actually put perfume on the altar for a couple of days and it would sort of charge it up with that protective influence or something. And then if you wore the perfume, it would be very protective. Um, a lot of the Muslim stuff uses written spells, like sometimes they would r do written charms with the incense to kind of give it a particular like uh, focus on so on. Uh, yeah, it's like a huge topic. Okay, other things here? Saskia? Uh, no, um, I don't have any questions. But um, anybody else? Um, or somebody asks, uh, for a men's cologne, would you use these spices? Uh, which spices would be best for attraction? Oh, okay. So um, the answer is that all of these spices are thought to be um, hot, and so they do make you hot, literally. So that's why I was trying to give you the theory. So in fact, pretty much any of them would be, um, you know, it, the, the peppers, the cloves, and things like that are very traditional, but pretty much most of these are used. Again, I didn't, I edited out a ton of stuff because I knew it would take too much time, 
like coriander, for instance, is very, it's considered very hot. Um, it's a very beautiful spice. I love it. It's used a lot in a men's, a lot of men's, um, traditional men's colognes and stuff because it has this whole citrus woody thing going on. Um, and it's used in a lot of uh, love spells. How did you determine that the spice blend reference to the uncrossing was essentially pumpkin pie spice? Um, well, that's a good question. That comes from someone I know who's much more knowledgeable than I am, that they've gone through a lot of these recipes and that when they use the word spice, there's sort of this uh, assumption that people are just referring to pumpkin pie spices because it would be a common place in the late 1920s in New Orleans that people would have pumpkin pie spices. It was just a thing that people would have. Um, so I'm taking that from someone who knows more about it than I do, but it could just be, I don't know, any kind of spice. Okay. Um, a fascinating majority of the ingredients of chai spices. Yes. So there's a whole bunch of things about giving people drinks and stuff. There's this whole tradition you know, in fairy tales, obviously, but also in spells where they, um, for instance, coriander, there's a whole thing where you do like a little chant, um, a little spell, and you grind it up and you add it to drinks in, in this spell called the loving cup, where you like bring love from a person, so on and so forth. Okay. Other things? Saskia, do you have questions? No, I'm totally fascinated. <laughs> Um, You're fascinating because it's very fiery and fiery things are fascinating. Yes. Yeah. So just to sort of like to wrap things up, um, you know, I just, the whole idea about fire and perfume is important. And the whole idea that fire worship is really part of, it's almost in wired. And in fact, every one of us, when we get up in the morning, what we do is we now turn on our phones and basically worship this kind of cold electrical fire and stare at it because there's something about us that just look, likes to look at shiny things. Um, and fire is, is, you know, enchanting. And this is an example of a, a perfume material, which is intrinsically kind of enchanting and fiery. Just quickly, Shahida has a question. Shahida is calling in from Kuwait, by the way, which is probably oh, the oh. farthest person we have here. But Shahida has a question about um, recommendations for reading or learning about the spice trade. Oh, okay. So, um, yes. So Mandy's book has a pretty good chapter, and I think she has some references. Um, I don't have it in this room, but there are a couple classic books on the spice trade. It's very fascinating um, if you're a person who's really interested in the history of like, uh, like how the whole financial system, the banking system, a lot of these things came from the spice trade and just, you know, the whole history of large groups of people moving from one place to another were fueled by this kind of craziness and the amount of money that you could make. Um, I mean, no one would have gone to these godforsaken places if it weren't for being greedy for these things. I mean, Columbus, wanted to find these spices he didn't he did in fact find i think the ones he found were red peppers cayenne and allspice which were like his consolation prizes um but you know this the, in, the influence on just like you know culture and so on is is really important yeah 